So we have a crowd of four. <laughs> so welcome to Ruby Tuesday and JavaScript event number four. So uh, um, this meetup is probably brought to you by the Ruby KL Brigade um, and also Kuala uh, Lumpur group. So Wi-Fi. So we have Wi-Fi password at the back. Um, it can poker, it can events, so you can grab that um, at the back. So um, for sponsors, our venue is sponsored by ACAT. So we'll be hosting our meetup for this month, next month, and December in ACAT. So throughout this year we'll be facing ACAT. Um, so um, I'm Gui. I'm one of the co-organizers of Ruby Malaysia and uh, organizer for Ruby Meetup in Penang. So we don't have a speaker here for this one. So let's welcome uh, Ivan. Nice. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I want to talk about like a small app. A very very small app, just a demonstration of how you can piece together puzzles of Ruby gems in order for a working little application. And I think this presentation is mostly for very Ruby beginners, as I'm a beginner myself. So that's that's the most I can do. <laughs> so I just wanted to start it, start this uh, slideshow with. Uh, quote from Matt and basically he always talks about how Ruby should be fun. It's the, that's the whole, that's the core idea behind Ruby and, and I really find it fun and I think uh, this little quote that we're gonna build today shows how easy it is to use Ruby and how quickly you can build stuff. So if, if you allow me, let me just talk about myself, just one few sentences. So I am a, I'm a creative director, I'm also a product manager, so I manage a typically quite complex digital product. So automation is very important because otherwise I would have to do a lot of manual work every day. So as much as possible I have to make all processes. Okay. And uh, I'm a Ruby programmer wannabe, so anyway, so let's do some Ruby. Um, so basically, uh, before we go into coding, I just wanted to explain what this little bot, what gems it's made of. So the first gem is, it's called Faker. And Faker is basically a, a little application which allows you to generate random text and it's typically used for testing um, applications so you have some real data in the, in the app and you can use that fake data to test your application and it can produce some really fun results. So it's a good way to, to test our app. The second one is uh, it's called our QR code gem and it allows you to encode any text or URLs or anything into a QR code. So since we need an image for our tweet, um, I thought that we can use this little gem to create an image. And then um, we're going to take the result of this, these two gems, the text and the end image, and use the Twitter gem to create a tweet and then finally push it into Twitter. So um, let me switch over to Terminal and Atom and basically I created a, an empty Ruby file there for rt.rb and uh, the first step is we're going to have to use the faker jam in order to, to create text. So I don't want you guys to, 
we want to be tired, so I'm just going to copy paste here all the code that is required. So the first step is obviously we're going to have to require all the gems. Do you expand or mirror? Oh, sorry. I'm just going to mirror the screen. So, we require the three gems that we're going to be using. That's the first step. And then the next step is. Oops. To, to generate the text. So, we just create a new variable, tweet text, and we use the, the faker gem to create some company bullshit, basically. <laughs> so. What this does is, um, let's just put out the output so to see what it does. So if I run this, so it created like a random sentence, utilized cutting edge web services. So this is like a cool way to generate this. Bullshit text. It's literally bullshit. So I'm just going to add more. So two sentences, and then we're going to add a name for the company, or like the, the person who is being quoted, a fake name here. And then we also add a fake company name and then the fake company type. So this is how the Ruby. Faker will generate us a tweet. Let's test it. So you can see it. this is the tweet. Um, it's not fully visible, but let me open it back so you can here see the full tweet. So now that we have text, uh, let's do the next step, which is create an image, which is going to be basically a QR code of this text. So here uh, we are creating an object with the RQR code gem and we are inputting the tweet text generated above into this uh, gem and it creates uh, a PNG file and we write it out into the disk here. So the name of that PNG file will be tweet image. There are some parameters that uh, this gem accepts. So, for example, you can provide the color for the QR code, size, and so on. There are so many more if you need to add. Uh, so, let's see what it does right now. Let me save this. Okay, so it created another bullshit tweet. And now we have in our folder a new image. If I click on it, it generated a QR code. And if you scan this QR code with your phone, it will actually give you the tweet text. So now we have an image, we have a text. So the next step is obviously to create a tweet. Um, so let me explain what is happening here. Um, first of all, this section is um, all the keys and secrets and tokens that are required to access the Twitter API. And I did that by, first of all, creating a, a new Twitter account just for this purpose. So there are no tweets in it yet. And then I asked for a developer account from Twitter for educational purposes, which they provided. And then, they, uh, and then I generated uh, an API key key and an access token with a secret. So I can plug all these details into my Ruby code. And it looks like this. And then all we have to do is call, it, call this method um, and update means create a new tweet. With media means a new tweet with a file, like uh, an image. And we feed in the text 
between in the, the image that was created and that's it so let's see if we can actually generate a tweet so I'm gonna open this here so I generated this tweet I'm pretty sure it generated the image too and it all, all went well we should be seeing the first tweet here so I'm just gonna re refresh the page didn't work for some reason. afternoon <laughs> but let me show you uh, how it looks like when it's actually working so here is another account that I'm using a similar code on so all these tweets are basically generated automatically with a similar piece of code uh, what happens here is we pull an RSS feed from this website, at of the World, and it provides um, some data such as the brand name, the title of an ad, the image, and so on. And then we generate these tweets and push them out into, into t Twitter. So all of these tweets are all generated with the script like that. <laughs> So, just to, to talk about some uses, um, obviously what you can do is you can automate tweets based on any data such as RSS feeds or stock market data or whatever data you have and you can also use it to build an audience. So for example, uh, you could find tweets that are um, hashtag by a certain keyword and then you can follow those people or retweet those people and you can also automate customer service so if you have lots of incoming customer service questions you can find keywords in those and answer those tweets automatically with a, with a knowledge base article that matches that question so these are the things you could do um, so, for example, here's a, a piece of code that would find a tweet with the hashtag business and it would retweet it. So, this code is um, wrapped in, in, a, in a block, in a loop, and it keeps going on and on and keeps finding um, new tweets with the hashtag business. We exclude any retweets and um, then it sleeps for 10 seconds and then keeps going on and then if we answer to this question do you want to retweet with yes then it will actually retweet that let me just try to run this and see if this works let me go back here okay so now it started working I'm not sure what was wrong maybe I had 
some of my body issues. Mm -hmm. But now you can see the tweet appearing as it should. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll try it again and see if it works. Just okay, good. So um, now I saved the file, so I have this piece of code here too. So it's looking for tweets. Uh, with a hashtag business, I did find one. So I'm gonna attempt to retweet it by answering yes. Now it found another one, but let's just go back and see if we actually did the retweet or not. So here you can see we generated two tweets, and the third one is a retweet. So at this point, this guy will notice that we started retweeting them. He will check out, check us out, and there is a chance that he will follow us back. So let's say out of 10 retweets, maybe two or three people will follow us back. So if we keep doing this on the long term, we could build up an audience. So I'm glad it started working. I'm not sure what was wrong before, but that's basically the end of my presentation. My name is Ivan, and this is my Twitter handle if you want to follow me, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions you guys may have. So it's um, because I saw that you are using a client, so does it work when you do a reply? So there's a post out, right? And yes. then there's a follow up reply, and then can you do a, like, a chatbot that continue to reply and then? Well, yes, if, if I can write um, some sort of uh, an algorithm which makes sense of the human language, I could, but I think that's really hard because okay. the number of different replies that could arrive is like vast, yeah. you know. I mean, I can, I can certainly do like, I, let's say my payment is stuck, what do I do? Then I can pick up payment stuck. I have a knowledge base article, I can push that up. But when they reply and say, no, no, what I meant is this, 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 then um, I'm okay. sure that the, the bot will just give up and it will be like, we are sorry, we don't know how to help you through the bot, some human will reach out to you. So that could be like the last tweet that they received that some human will okay. reach out. Yeah. But still, at least they received an instant reply which may solve their issue. Yeah. If it doesn't, then Okay. You still have to fall back to humans. Okay. Just for supports, they normally like an instant reply. We'll get back to you. We notice that we um, we acknowledge your questions. We'll get back to you in like, three days or one day. They won't, they like that instant uh, reply. So if yes. uh, the chat able to just provide instant reply without knowing what he, the person asked, just reply, mm -hmm. and then they'll feel, oh, okay, someone acknowledge. Yeah, that that's something true. Like that. It's kind of like a, an auto reply on mm -hmm. email, right? Yep, yep, yep. So even if it doesn't know what it is, correct. Hey, thanks for reaching out, we'll be back. Yep. Yeah, that's good. So that that will be one of the better improvement on the current existing code, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. It's a good idea. Cool, cool. Any more Thank questions? you so much. Yep. Is there any way to like mm. do error reporting or like just now why did it fail when it was Yes, I think so. So I think if uh, the tweet fails, the Twitter API does give you a... Uh, it does return an error message. Yes, it does give me an error message and I, I, could, um, could, I could build a block um, with an escape. To, to rescue the operation and then maybe part of the rescue it would be to log what happened. So in this case I probably didn't have internet connection for a second or something like that, I'm not sure what was it. And um, yeah, it would have been good to know what happened there. But like I was wondering like what would you do in Ruby to be something similar to promises in JavaScript? So like they would do an asynchronous action? And then they will return mm. whatever. I'm not sure. Mm. Then Ruby does. Mm. Ruby like does do. Catch. Yeah, it can only do try catch, like a normal exception catching. So it doesn't do a callback like JavaScript. JavaScript is a 
Async, yeah, it's different. Non blocking async. So Ruby, you can like that. Uh, you mentioned about proc, right? So you can record that and then print out the stack trace to find out what's going on with it. For promises, I don't think that's an equivalent way of doing that. Yeah. For, yeah, for Ruby. Try and catch will be the best. Yeah, so far, try and catch will be the to go way. The only code now is the JavaScript is going back to try and catch. Okay. Yeah. 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 So next we'll be going for the Python uh, for the JavaScript track. So serverless web crawler. So you'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so uh let's see what is my problem. Okay. Okay, so um Serverless web crawler. So, what is serverless? First, we find out uh, the definition of serverless computing is a cloud computing execution model, in which the cloud provider access a server and they manage the resource for you. So, in the traditional um, server uh, management, it's like you buy a VPS and then you configure yourself, you configure your firewall, you need to have a fixed CPU, the fixed size of RAM, um, and then you need to configure all the configuration on the server side. So serverless took that out of the equation, so you don't need to have a sysadmin. It runs program, it scales automatically, it uh, gives you all the resources that you need when your uh, program wants to, like, you want to have like, eight cores during one time, it will scale it for you. You don't have to manually buy another set of server and then migrate the traffic to another server. And then the RAM also. So at one time, maybe the low traffic is like one gigabyte will work. For peak hours, you will, you will need like 16 or 32. So it automatically scales it for you. You don't have to worry a lot about like how to manage the server. It takes that out of the uh, the workload. So as a developer, it's very easy. You just need to push, and everything is there, um, and it scales nicely for uh, most of the use cases. <coughs> so um, how many options that you have in a serverless service? <coughs> so for now, we know that there's an AWS, um, uh, I think AWS uh, Lambda, and then uh, Cloud Functions from Google and also um, Azure functions. So all these are the options for serverless. And then um, they currently support JavaScript, mostly JavaScript. Uh, AWS support Python. Cloud Function recently support Python 3. Previously it support Python 2. Um, Azure functions, I'm not sure about that. I think they just support uh, JavaScript. Other than that, they don't support any of the box. Um, so next we move on to web crawler. So like what is a web crawler? So a web crawler sometimes called a spider or a spider bot and then it's crawl throughout the internet and the main purpose of it is to do uh, web indexing. So for us uh, this talk this talk will be more towards a scraper. We're doing most of the scraper by using a crawler. So, um, in short, like a crawler, you just provide a list of URLs and then it crawls through the HTML and finds more links and then go deep 
and then it's crawl more and then going deeper and deeper, finding the uh, the network among each URL. So URL one links to URL two, two to three, and then build the web of uh, URL. So uh, there's multiple way of um, crawling. So for this start, we'll be using Puppeteer. Puppeteer is a, a framework uh, written in uh, JavaScript. It's using uh, Chromium on uh, V8 engine, uh, the Chrome V8 engine. So that's news from uh, Google that Puppeteer is now supported in uh, Cloud Functions. So that's a link there. Uh, so let's go to check on the code. So for Puppeteer, you can see this is the site, pptr.dev. So it's a node, node library um, and uh, provides a high level API to control Chrome. Um, and it runs on, it runs headless. So why Puppeteer on uh, serverless? Because when you run um, application serverless, you don't have the pleasure of installing problem. So you don't have a browser running by default in your setup. So Puppeteer, the advantage of using Puppeteer is when you install the library, it installs the Chromium browser on the serverless service. So you will have a Chromium running with your cloud functions. So that's the advantage of using Puppeteer. If you use uh, like Selenium, it doesn't work because Selenium still requires a browser to be on your uh, serverless server. The interface, the interface uh, Chrome driver. So you still can include a Chrome driver, but you still need a Chrome browser or a Firefox browser, for example, on the server itself, which normally doesn't have. So Puppeteer makes sure that the server will have a browser for you to use, right? So uh, this is what the code that I'm supposed to show. One thing different about headless Chrome and Chrome is one you don't have you don't need to have the G1. Yes. Okay. So for headless Chrome using for Puppeteer, the, the default is using the headless Chrome. So that it knows how HTML is is rendered, how the structure it is. But it doesn't have to render it into a page like a G1 for you. So it's like something to just fetch websites to fetch HTML process. Yes, you can say that is. Yes. But the difference is that if you fetch HTML, you come back from all the JavaScript you learned before it, but public yet they can do it. So you can do it, you can do a proper a scrubber for the SPA website. Right. So, um, normally when you want to run a browser on the server, you don't need a GUI at all. Like it doesn't work. If you try to pop a GUI up, it will throw an error, and then you might exit your program. So better to run a headless, like normal QA or testing. If you use RSpec, um, you will use some sort of a browsing server like uh, Phantom JS, one of the popular ones, Phantom JS. Um, you can run it in headless mode and then do the op operations. You still get the HTML back, it's just the response, and then you can just um, do extract the data out of it and verify with your test cases. So, from here, what we are trying to do is doing a screenshots. So, although you are in headless mode, you're still able to screenshots. It's not that you need to pop up in the UI and then you're able to screenshot. You still can screenshots. Um, at the background. So this is uh, the example of using Puppeteer. <coughs> First you just include the library and then you wait for the Puppeteer to launch. So a wait in JavaScript is to wait until this process finish before we move to the next one. Because JavaScript is, is uh, non-blocking so it will move on if you don't put a wait. You will just move to the next one if it's the first time it takes longer. And then uh, so you wait for the browser to uh, give you a page. So normally you click the browser, then a new tab will give you a page, right? And then you go to the, that page. Then you still wait for it to load, and then you do a screenshot. So uh, 
you can run it by using Node because it's a Node library. So we we'll have like screenshot of the ng. Something like this, you will have one screenshot. So, this is an example um, of using uh, the puppeteer. So, next we'll be going for the cloud functions. So, uh, if you read uh, cloud functions tutorial, so that's a way from, for, uh, from Google to how to write your cloud functions. So you need to export the functions so that you can call it. That's the base. So uh, you basically need to do something like this. You need to do an export so that you able to uh, to use the program as uh, I would say as a library, I would say a module, maybe a JavaScript module, because when you export it becomes a module and then you deploy that module um, to Google Top uh, functions. Documentation. Okay. So uh, there's also an emulator. It will show you how to use that emulator. So you can see that um, it supports Node.js 6, 8. The latest one is 8. The older one is 6, which is a legacy. And they support it. Great. Um, so let's do this. So you need to do like cloud functions deploy, aim, and then the runtime trigger. So the runtime, we will put um, just aim, and then the trigger is the events. So when you export screenshots, the trigger will be called screenshots. This one will be called screenshots. Right. Okay. Something like this. Is it deploy? Triggers is trigger all. Oh, it's a different flag. So let's see. Trigger this function in case of HTTP. So this there's uh, some option for this. Uh, you do gcloud function deploy screenshots runtime node.js 8 yeah node.js 8 uh, and then trigger http so you can hit the cloud function using http request um, so let's see that's another one called a cloud function emulator So um, for cloud functions, you don't not just uh, able to just push it to Google. You can uh, em uh, simulate it locally, but this is still in alpha. It's very not stable. <laughs> I ran it before. Uh, Puppet is not supported with emulator right now. It only support uh, ES six. So if you write cloud functions that um, compatible with ES six, it will work locally. So how to deploy? Um, first, you just need to install um, the functions emulator and then you set your project ID, function start, and then you just deploy without um, just now when we see, see the deploy is different, right? Deploy here is you have a runtime 
this doesn't have a runtime because it only works on one Node.js 6 it doesn't support 8 8 is still in beta so if you want to run uh, cloud functions Let's see whether I have my So um, it, it currently runs in beta mode, so it's something like this, and see, you need to define the cloud beta rather than the normal gcloud functions, and then you deploy it uh, with the runtime of Node.js 8, and you give it a memory. So <clears throat> 1024 is not enough, from what I read, read from the forum and the GitHub, GitHub issues, it requires at least 2 GB to work for AWS Lambda. Unfortunately, Google Cloud doesn't work. <laughs> um, I've been working with this for uh, a week plus and I'm still waiting for a response from the Google support. doesn't get back to me yet about the issue. So actually, if you go for uh, Cloud uh, functions. Uh, here, uh, shoot. Then you will find for issues coming up. Then, yeah. So it's asking for things like right? doesn't work. And then it's taking too long, it's taking too many memory. So somehow for lambdas, AWS lambdas, it still works fine. Um, a lot of um, success stories from lambda. However, for um, cloud functions, they would say that you, they prefer to run it on uh, App Engine. So basically, if you run cloud functions, it's somehow similar to App Engine where it scales your app like that it's it's just a, a app engine will run 24 7 unless you turn it off cloud functions is when you trigger then it runs when it finishes it shut down that's cloud function so you only use it when you need it that's the benefit of using cloud functions if not you will be good enough using an app engine that will work fine right so, why Google Function doesn't work? Um, just I'll show you the issue, the GitHub part. Um, one is performance, and secondly, I'm not sure whether I can get to my console. Let's see. I run it, I have my Google Functions running. So you need to activate it in order to be able to use it, right? Um, for Cloud Functions, it's uh, very nice because you still can edit your code from the editor here, directly from the browser. Um, and it shows a very nice uh, UI, uh, I would say the report, the issue reports. So let's say you have to JV now. We have two JV. JV web memory. Ah, oh, yeah, two GB, correct. Yeah, because if if not, it, at first I thought that is an issue, so I increase the RAM. In the end, it's not. So there's a lot of um, errors, crash happens. I follow exactly what they mentioned in the documentation. It still doesn't work. I try to modify it um, using. The feedback from the issue is still having issue, so uh, I'm still um, trying to get um, the help from Google. So there's some um, my logs, all logs. 
last time of the time they went. That's our all. Everything. Everything. Truly everything. Okay. So, there's a lot of issues here. If we can pick one, I'll handle rejection. So, uh, it also helps you to uh, show like, what happens to your functions, what errors. So, it says, okay, invalid URL. So, I try to print it. It's a valid URL. I have no idea why it's showing that. And then, uh, there's more. This is still the URL. There's some error. This one. We will try try catch. <laughs> try catch. I think I directly print the URL. It's the correct URL. So the thing is, something wrong with the promise. Something wrong with the promise. Okay, basically, I see a way code this or whatever in yeah. JavaScript is a promise. Yep, correct. But the thing is that the way you run it is different. If you go back to your code, the old one, not this one. This is the one that you're able to push to cloud function because you need to have an export. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, all the so called open, you should need to work inside try catch. Okay. And then uh, inside the catch, you just put on the error or something. And how to handle it or whatever. Okay. Yeah, need to check on that. And then, yeah, we'll need to check that and see so what's going on. That's also the question. For promise, yes, this is using the catch. But if you're using the way, then you have to use try catch. So you have to like write it manually? So you have to write try block and then await something, await something, await something, await something, and then you have to write a catch block at the bottom. To handle it, yeah. So, like, if you take promises, you usually just new promise. Yeah, right. Basically, the way it's the same. Just the way you write is different. Yeah, the same thing as this. Yeah. So then, when the, the script run, it will also show something like this: time out, try to connect to Chrome, but it failed. So, I will say cloud function is not there yet. The, the stability because it also fails to connect to its Chrome browser itself. So something happened somewhere. No idea. Yeah, still oh. waiting for the answer. How exactly do you trigger it? Like? So you just call the HTTP. So you can do a. It depends how you want to structure your cloud functions. You can push, do it in a get function. So for me, I do it in get. Um, I using query. So query basically is a question mark equals question mark and then something URL equals to something. So it's doing a get. Request and then they will run it, or you want to do a post request, they will work too. Um, and uh, serverless works for uh, works for Python also. So if you want to write a Python cloud function, it will work too. Just that it only support Flask. That's it. No Django, no other things. It only support Flask. Yeah. So it mostly mostly deal with like here you can see plus. It mo mostly deal with the uh, HTTP request. So you trigger something and then do something. So plus is a very light, uh, like something like Sinatra in movie. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, oh, that's the end of it. So any questions? Yeah. No, uh, yep. So you like make the URL request like for the uh -huh. uh, postman or like you yes. just put on your URL browser. So browser. your browser, the web address, oh, you just put yeah, it, you just put it in there. Request it. Request. Correct. When when a new any search for browser is yeah. get the request. Yes. So then it will load like load on the browser page. Is it? It returns the screenshot. Okay. Yeah, from from here, it's return a screenshot. But because this is not working, so it will just throw a five hundred error. So server <laughs> error. If not, it will send uh, the binary 
create the content type image PNG. So you recognize as an image and then you will render on your browser. You can do a curl, it will work too. It will just return you a binary of the JPEG. Uh, not JPEG PNG. Yeah. So something to explore. If you're doing Lambda, worth to try because it seems like Lambda have a higher success rate. And then if you're doing testing, you still can do it. You can use Puppeteer to run the test. It works too. I don't have an account there. I don't want to spend money on <laughs> OP stuff yet. But I think you got a free tier for Lambda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you say that it works better on AWS? There's a sample of it saying that it works slightly better. After GitHub issues, yeah. it shows that it runs on one tier lesser RAMs. Yeah, than here. Lambda. Okay. It runs 1 GB but for cloud functions to cloud more. Maybe it's, there's extra stuff running in the background that we have no idea. Oh, I see. Yeah, extra dependency. So, how long do you think it will take until this is ready for production? Hopefully, like, end of the year. <laughs> Hopefully, because a lot of people are excited about this because uh, you don't have to spend a lot if you want to just one shot. Because if you want to use a property, you don't need it 24 7 yeah you just okay one try swing up kill it down something like that so cloud function works fine are there any um like well-known applications or sites that use this technology so far serverless yes uh yes now yes so this is also presented in the uh, KL Ruby meetup, uh, KL JavaScript meetup. So um, now JS, it's actually good. You just push it, and then everything's up, and it be able to resolve your DNS and everything. So um, it runs preferably on serverless, uh, but you still can do extra stuff. Uh, things that running on serverless right now, uh, base. Base IO is running serverless. This website is serverless. Or what do I you remember they are doing DNS. I think it's serverless. Yeah, I think it's serverless. Oh, the, this app is it's a whole website. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think they are doing serverless. Vase uh, IO. I think Vase is doing part of their infrastructure. Is it process? <laughs> Not this Vase. Okay. Maybe they change our website. Ah, this one. So uh, this what this team is using serverless, but not all their features are serverless. Some of those, your serverless might not fit your use cases. It depends. If you have a lot of requests, you should use serverless. Yes. Yeah. Mm. It is costing a lot more than uh, CPU or engines. I heard that Udacity uses serverless, but I'm not sure. Udacity, maybe, maybe yeah, some of them. Maybe. Udacity video is from YouTube, so so probably not serverless. But something like if you are doing a movie website or whatever, serverless might be a good fit. Because for example, one user they grab for is watching one movie in part time or whatever. You know that you don't need to spin out the whole website for that. Yeah. It's just like one clip. How many were going for the serverless statement and how many are really at it? Correct. Yeah. And so then this is mostly for cost. Yeah, cost yeah. effective and then um, you don't have to manage your infrastructure, I would say. Yeah. Um, it's quite popular in the mobile application side because if you want to take out the backend completely, you can just write the cloud functions to do your um, server rendering or server calculation. All the other stuff is on your mobile phones. So you call uh, cloud functions and return some results and then uh, any other stuff is just normal mobile usage. So you eliminate the need of uh, backend. Oh, yeah. So that's one of the use cases too. Okay, any more questions?
no time to move to Siwalim. So, topic from Siwalim would be. I think you have the slides there. Huh? You have the slides? Or? I have, have slides. Okay, this one. It's just uh, very, very basic. Okay, so, so, what we are going to do is that so basically this topic is not something really complicated, it's just like a basic situation. Like Windows 10, uh, if you break yeah. enough, you have to create the Windows 10. I think the new one, the new update coming up for this one is with the platforms. They're no. doing the dark mode. Someone upgrade their Windows 10. Uh. All their files in their document. Yeah, all the files gone for updating Windows, Windows 10 October updates. Correct. Yeah. If, if you update Windows 10 October updates, you lost all your files. Yeah. That's one of my friend lost 20, 220 gigab GB of files. It's like your artist, you have have it. Correct. It's like how do they this make these kind of mistakes? So, <laughs> so a lot of issues. They just take down the updates. Okay. So my topic is uh, the basic that I with Node.js. Uh, I'm CY, a full stack software engineer. Basically, I'm freelancing and I have a digital nomad traveling around the world, around Southeast Asia. So, the most basic backend software is like the RESTful APIs. And for doing RESTful API with the Node.js, basically, you need to go to the Node.js website and then so go to Node.js website, download the Node.js and LTS means for long term support is a uh, support for three years and then so downloading the version 8 or 10 is totally fine and for the Node.js itself it will come with the npm package manager if you doesn't like the NPM package manager, usually people will go for Young package. It's another package manager developed by Facebook. <coughs> it's like a bit faster than the latest version of NPM. So and then after that, you probably just need to create documents. Uh, then just run yarn ini or npm ini to start a very plain simple project and then after you init it then you have to install the express.js or whatever other server backend framework for using it and what is the difference between Express.js and other source framework is like if you are from Python background, just now Gumet he mentioned about the Flask and Django. Flask, Flask is like something very lightweight and Django is something like Ruby or Rails. It's like it can automatically help you generate a lot of stuff. Express is one of the languages that doesn't help you generate a lot of stuff. If you are the automatic generation or whatever Actually, in JavaScript world, they have something called CLJS. So this is something that they can help you a lot with your developments. But ExpressJS is like the lightweight versions. So the basic way to get started is like young at Express. You can just check that like you are using NPM in it, that you use young to continue on. Pardon? Uh, is it exchangeable, the package manager? It's totally exchangeable. The only difference is like if you use Yarn to install the package, it will generate something called Yarn Logs. And you use npm to generate package, it will call package JSON log. So, so the difference is that it keeps the versioning in different files. 
then you probably will install the wrong version of the apps you are using. I mean, wrong version of those packages you are using. But basically, it's the same. So, okay, this is the part. And then uh, there's like something called npm list dev zero. So it will show that what package you install. If you did put something like dev zero, it will show a lot of everything underneath it. So usually, I will just dev zero. It will let you know what you install in the current project. If you have like something dev three, it means global. So it will show what you install in the global. On your machines. So let's do that. And that's to get started with Node.js. And then following up is the demo how to write a simple Express app. So basically, for this project, I did add a few dependencies. Also which I use later, but it doesn't really matter right now. And then another dependency under here is called Dev Dependency. Basically, it's when you add it with something called Young Add Dash Dash Dev, that it will add it to anything called Development Dependency. So for getting started, basically, you just need to create some files called index.js. And then you require the Express framework, and then you create an apps or Express, or you can directly do it like this with apps. But I prefer to separate it because for the top part, basically, it's for the imports, and then for generating some things, and then following is like setting the ports and and listening for the apps. So basically for now start. And <coughs> ask and apps without handling any of the rules. So it will just return that when I try to get the roof the path for it, it just return that okay I cannot get it because you didn't handle it. So that I can probably add in some basic handler. For the first one, it basically is mean that okay, for the root path, I want to send a file from my current directory with the names index.html. For anything else, I would like to send a 404, not file. So if I go back to the root path, it will say that welcome to the chat because of I have something, a template which they got inside. And then if I just go to any, anywhere else, it will just say no file. So that's the most basic. Can you see it? Okay, and then. This still ha doesn't really handle any RESTful API call or whatever, it just handles the get options. So I can add in another thing called, okay, for the API path, I need to have a prefix with APIs, and it will go to a file called roots.js to get more options. So for example, if I go to roots.js, I still doesn't have any endpoint, so that I can add a few. Right now, it's just like importing back the Express.js and then create a router. One thing is about why over here you need to create a router for handling the path is because I didn't pass the app into the file. I'm just importing the routes back into the app files. There's a few ways to handle the file, the file structures. You can directly use the apps.get or apps.post or app.s whatever to handle it. But when it comes to a case that you are importing the roots from somewhere else, it doesn't know what is the app is, then you will use something called routers. 
And for now, I just have one basic router that no matter it's a GET request, POST request, or whatever request, for any path from slash API, it will just return 4, 400 API not available. So if I go back to here, so anything not in API is not found. Anything under API is will be API not available. Okay. And this is not a good way to handle in the data, but for demonstrate purpose, I did create a database for it. So I just like, assume there's some data, data over here. And this is uh, using a router to create and uh, create two different paths. One is dot get, it's a HTTP get request for the slash message. It will return all the data. And another one is dot post for the message. And then I will just get any anything passed into the post request body. And uh, Basically, just get anything passed into a post request body and then push it back into the data. Then I'll return a 200 and success full success status. So for now, if you go back to 800, 800, where does it go? Okay, there are some other problems that a lot control, a lot access control, a lot origins. So the issues came with like I didn't set the CORS control, cross origin resource S I have no idea why it's S anymore. <laughs> Maybe you can show it down. Course. Yeah. Stations. So basically in Chrome's by default it will block you from accessing anything that the path the URL is not similar with your URL. But right now, this is our local host, and then over here, if I'm not mistaken, it's like probably it's a one two seven point zero point one or something. Oh, the API request I made is one two seven point zero point zero point one. That's why it's different. It will treat it as a different host. It doesn't know that it's the same things. So that's why that's why we need to add more libraries. This is not express is at one two seven. Pardon? Uh, what's at one two seven point? One two seven point zero point zero point one. It means local host. Local host. It means your own machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But sometimes we can go into the EDC slash host to change local host to another machine. Oh. We can change one two seven one. 1.27.0.0.1 to end machines. So sometimes it doesn't really know that local host is 1.27.0.0.1. So currently I'm importing a lot more other library. What is so called body parsers? So basically everything's come in from request, I mean from HTTP post request inside the body. Express doesn't know how to handle it by default, but if with something called the body parser libraries, it will treat it as request.body. And then another one is compressions. Compression basically is like gzip, it makes everything smaller. And then CORS means the cost origin. You can access to any others. I mean, it's not you can access to any other. It's like for these bad answers, any service can access to you unless you specify otherwise for the whitelist or blacklist. Common is something like security headers, it's like it will remove something, some headers from your website or adding a, a little bit more helpful things to reduce the chance to get hacked. So if you don't really know what it's about, basically you can just search for the package team at NBM. And basically, if you want to get more information about it, there's two ways one is to go to an NBM.js package to understand about it. And the better one is just directly go for the GitHub. And over here, it was just like telling you 
by default, what's, what's this comment about? So it will do something like doesn't allow my DNS prefetching, prevent quick checking, or something like this. So this thing, if you are using something like Ruby or Rails, probably it will automatically handle a lot of this for you. But if you're using something like Flash or Express, you need to consider about this. So after importing it, you still need to use it. And <coughs> some of this is quite important in the orders because also in this case it's not, but in some cases it is. For example, these two things, if I change the orders, then it will mean that no matter what I go for, it will go for not file instead of going for index.html. So some of the code, the order is quite important, but some of it is not that important. So with the just now with the COIS, now you can get the data. But when you okay, so for now, let me turn on another browser. But the issue about sending a message is like I can send the message, but and it successfully sent. If I go back, you can yeah, you can see that the message is there, but it doesn't show in another part. That's when the web socket come into play. So Basically, there's two things we do, we use for real-time communication between the servers and the clients or maybe between client and clients. One is the WebSocket and another one is WebRTC. WebRTC, they have like different way of doing it. They have a turn server and a start server. Basically, a start server means that client is committed, communicating with client directly. And if the connection is not stable enough, they will turn into the turn server so that any package or whatever you go into a middle server and then you go to another client. But for WebSocket, no matter how, it will become there will be a WebSocket server and then multiple clients. So let's demonstrate how to use WebSocket for the apps. Basically, when you go back to the apps, you can. Okay, so the difference between WebSocket is that uh, you need to import another library called socket.io and then for Express app, you cannot use app to serve anymore. You need to create the apps through HTTP instead of using the Express. But the best thing is that uh, the default HTTP server provided by the Node.js, it allows you to specify what server you are going to use. In this case, we are using the Express apps. So for now, I will change the server listen, the app listen to the server listens. And then probably, okay, I doesn't really care about the, the structure, but if, if I care, then this thing should be moved to the top, somewhere around here. So usually people will put all the required on top and then put other things on other places following the orders. So then you'll call you'll create the socket server, but in this case I have another file called socket.io, socket.js. This file basically is just like getting the server from, from index.js. Yeah. Okay, I pass the server into the socket. Socket basically is what I export from the socket.js. So that when I pass the server into the socket from the socket.io, it will start the socket server. And I add an event listener for the send message. So whenever I trigger this event, send message, it will call these functions. This function will emit the message to the channel called chat room. So in this case, I only have one chat room. 
if I have multiple channel, I probably can do something like using the ID over here or maybe using chat room slash the ID and it can be dynamic so it's, it should be fine so uh, for the IO connection basically this thing, this part is just like you can handle something over here for example if you want to store the sections into a server or something else but in this case we don't have to uh, but disconnect whether you want to shut down the server or restart or something there is something you can consider about doing it in the IO dot on connections so then from when I am posting a message I should I should emit send an event to the event listener that I want to send a message with the body I get from the front end and then okay that, that's for the back end part inside the front end part basically you just need around five line of code to handle it it's just uh, so the first one is like uh, you get the socket.io script the J, the JAWS file from the CDN or your own server or whatever you want it from and then you connect to the socket socket and then when you are listening to the chat room channel so if you have other channel when you are in different path of your URL you probably can listen to it and then basically I just create a paragraph elements put in the name and message and then append it back into the HTML So maybe I can sign a message over here and it's supposed to receive over here. So the socket server is running on your local cloud, right? Yeah, it's running on my local cloud. So for this HTML file, basically it's nothing. It's just like a div for the chat containers and then a form for actions to send the messages through the API call for using the post and then getting the name and message and for another JavaScript it basically is uh, loading the data from using the HTTP request to the APIs slash message so this is a very basic implementation for uh, RESTful APIs and also socket programming go back to this so now today people are going for another idea is called GraphQL so what is the difference between GraphQL and socket and also RESTful API for this one I don't really prepare any presentations I mean any demo for it but I can probably just go a few of it so for GraphQL you basically just import I mean declare your, your, code, your model structure inside the GraphQL and then you can have predefined queries that you can just get anything unless you have to handle something like the authentications when there's authentication involved then you have probably have to create a separate function inside the GraphQL query so that you can have different query for different things for example in this case I can go for so for example I can so okay for GraphQL if it will always come with something wrong, known as GraphQL interact graph interactions query language. So you can have like the very 
easy way. You doesn't really need to ask people to create documents or whatever. You can just go inside. Okay, for this app, I have query and mutations. Query means that get you are getting data, and then what is the function names? What you supposed to provide and what it returns. You can go inside what it returns and you can see what is it all about and some of it probably is an array of even more products. And then for mutations, basically it means something like post request. You are making changes to the to the database or to something else. And this tool is like a very basic one when it involving authentications. But there is a third one, it's called event or channel or whatever, I forget about it. Graph view uh, I think it's event. Okay. Subscriptions. So the third one, they have another thing it's called Graph view subscriptions. It basically functions like WebSocket. It, it's an event based, for example, anything changes on the server side, it will notify all the clients who connect with the server. Subscribe to this subscription channel. <coughs> okay, I think basically that's all about my talks. Do you guys have any questions? GraphQL. So, because GraphQL, there's an issue on the performance side of GraphQL. Yeah, it definitely has some issue of performance because, for example, you have multiple servers mm -hmm. and then it all go through one graph URL and then all the front ends to consume from one graph URL and a lot of people they doesn't really care about it. For example, graph URL you declare all the model as the inside query that you can have like multi nested level of query mm -hmm. in one query and people tend to get all the things. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of the projects I'm currently working on, they are, they are using GraphQL, but the issue is that they're calling, they're calling the GraphQL queries and they get everything. They, they are not just getting the things they need. Oh, okay. It's like they are lazy on uh, Well, the it's not like they are lazy, but the thing is like, even though where it's back in the SQL world or the RESTful API, a lot of people just like select or cat the string and everything from the database. Mm -hmm. So it's typically how people do things until they met, they have the performance issue, then they'll try to optimize it. And for GraphQL, you can have multi, uh, multiple nodes of GraphQL server to handle it as well. The only the biggest problem about GraphQL is that uh, you add uh, one more layer between your clients and your backends. Mm, yeah. Okay, so it's on the API layer level, API layer, right? Yeah, I know. So basically, okay, for GraphQL, if you don't have authentication issues, that it should be fine. You doesn't really need to have your own backend to create your own query for the for those need authentications. But if your app involves a lot of secrets, you need authentications. Then the most fundamental, the, the best feature provided by GraphQL is not usable anymore. You need to create a lot of different queries with your own function needs. And you have query through those need, mm -hmm. and basically you just do for those kind of way of doing this. You need your own another one that ends. Correct. Yeah, makes sense. Is there any way to get the code from you for for reference? Is it is it okay? But I like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See you. See you. See you. Like, code sample. Uh, it's like your app. I like to study and yeah. uh, speak. Oh, you can just saw that app. Yeah, sample. Yeah, although it's very. Yeah, 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 yeah,
slides now. Right now, I'm here. So, I did create another folder for another thing for it. It's uh, on my GitHub page. And there's a folder for slide and 2018 autobus. And then uh, inside the demo, there will be all the code for it. Because uh, mm. usually, I'm, like, I'm right now, I'm working with view the whole framework itself, so I don't really get much chance to look like write it from very bad. So, so that's like, quite eye opening to see how it was to like, sort of start up from <laughs> bad demons. Yeah, because probably when people join the team, it's just maintained, they haven't from scratch so this is a very good one for people to know like, actually how to build from scratch to be honest for this this demo i didn't really structure the code in a really good way so it's not following the best practice for structuring all the code one thing about real is that compared to other compared to something like this is that real they have like a guideline how to structure everything how to put everything in different files and everything else but for Node.js is a chaos world, we can do it anywhere we want. I can actually put all of those code into one file and it's just quite right. fine. But when you separate it into different files, you need to think of the way how to export the models, how to put it into it again. It's the management issue of um, Yep, the code management issue, yeah. Let's go for <laughs> You can just change it. You can connect it first. So, thanks CY for sharing. And then let's go to the five tactics. Any tactics? Any. Uh, any tactics. We have four people about five tactics. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for me, let's see. Oh, yeah. So, for Ruby RBM, normally when uh, Ruby runs uh, RBM installation, it will in insert a file into .bash rc <coughs> uh, profile. Uh, so you can see something like this, but it doesn't work on Linux because Linux doesn't load bash profile first. It yes. loads profiles. Oh, profile. Yeah. So that is. Uh, let's see. That is. Uh, where's my? Too many tabs. <laughs> That's my thing. Okay, I don't know where is my. Yeah, never mind. So, um, for Linux, it runs dot profile because it is uh, independent on any terminal that you use. So bash is just for bash. For Ubuntu, it runs on uh, dash, D-A-S-H. So if you your configuration is inside dot profile, it will load so that um, you don't have to do like, so if, I think, okay, here. So something like this, right, the RBM. So if I remove this, then I source profile. So if I do, so normally it will do this. If you have RBM, it will load the RBM stuff. So I close it down. I open it again. It shouldn't be doing that anymore. Or it would, I don't know. So it would, okay, you already cached. Fine. So um, if you don't have it in the blog profile, you need to type bin bash login in order to have your RBM ready. If not, it won't read your dot RBM RC file. So that's one of the catch I when I work with uh, RBM. Turn it back. Yeah, that's the Ruby tips for uh, RBM. 
Any more tips? How do you ask the version? Yeah, a Ruby version for the version manager. But how do you ask the using like RB? EMB, yes, that's a different one. So there's multiple way of uh, managing uh, Ruby version. RVF is the oldest one, the very old one. RB EMB is the newer one. So RVM will separate all the gem files according to their specific um, gem set. While RB EMB will share the library, so you don't you won't install the same library over and over again. RVM will install it full and over again because it's strictly isolated by environment. So you will see your library file will getting bigger and bigger and bigger because you're doing repeated install, but it's good for isolation. Yeah. Pure isolation. Um, like npm, you want to share like how to manage npm? Package. So uh, for Node.js, we have a thing called npm. So basically, you can install whatever version of Node.js, and then it will be saved as rvm that all of the version have isolated version of their own packages. But the thing is that if you want to install a new version of the NVM and you want the old version package with it, so you can just like run it something like NVM, install the latest version number, and then with double dash, reinstall old package, reinstall package from the old version number, then you will restart all the package from the old version to the new versions. Then you can just simply remove your old versions. We would have compatibility issue because the old version will use the older. Usually it won't, but if it has, then it will just some warning showing on the screen. Uh, okay, so NPM. Okay. okay. More thing, thing right? Okay. So, so how do you like show the like you type in the cons required for the JavaScript library, right? No. On your Visual Studio Code, there was this part where it showed the file size of it. Oh, there's a part in inside Visual Studio Code. It's called Auto Import Scores. Auto Import. Auto Import. Cost. Cost. C O S T. Not only for cost. Oh, it's quite nice. Uh, you sort of know how much trash they are editing. Yeah, but it won't be actually actual one because with Webpack 4, they actually have a better tree shakings. Uh, the file size will be eventually even smaller than the real one. So the import cost is uh, something for you to see, but it won't be the actual size for it. It's just a sort of estimation. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice stuff. Nice stuff. Nice stuff. Can I ask what's uh, actually what's tree shaking? Tree shaking is mean that your file one folders it have like five folders, and every folder has different files, and you just probably using one, one of the folder of one of the files. So it's so basically this kind of structure is called a tree. So you shake it until you just have the one you are using. So the other leaf it go down, it drop away. So there's only the leaf you are using is on the on the tree. So the one you would import. Maybe the one we're using the for production or for for, for production. So basically for example like no dash if you import everything you will be a 70 key. KB mm -hmm. and if you import only the unique ID will be in KB. So basically it has the three shaking functions. It shakes all the other part, other fun, other methods it doesn't use at all. It doesn't in include it in your production. Mm -hmm. yeah. So okay. you call it tree shaking, it basically it is a tree shaking. And then on the least Yeah. Okay. Good stuff, good stuff. That's good. Um, okay, we we'll come next week. So speaker for next meetup. I want to get at least two first because like it's very hard to get speaker. At least two. <laughs> you can actually speak on view because you work on view. You probably share some like a 
a basic one how to get started with you that will be good also just like you before yeah yeah yes yeah. so get one you know him you your colleague because we have colleague anymore oh yeah ex colleague <laughs> I asked already if you want to reply or like even Victor Chives. Yeah, so very hard. Never mind, we we'll try to see how to get more. Shout outs! Any Harry? No Harry. No Okay. I'm uh, looking for jobs. Not looking for jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you for being here and see you on the next video. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.